to see him. I hate to embarrass him, but our old friend Mike Chris Thomas. We lived here for many, many years. <laughs> okay. Um, other things. Uh, that the exhibit upstairs is called um, uh, the Nez Perce in Oregon Removal and Return. It was built for the state capitol building. Had to fit into a 10 foot by 10 foot space. Coley Riggs, who's not here, I did the kind of the, the words and Coley did all the visuals there. And, uh, but you will get a chance to see it for a month or six weeks. It's going to be at the lobby at Bolao uh, Memorial Hospital before it goes to the state capitol. Awesome. Um, and uh, let's see, also upstairs, and this stays here forever. That Nez Perce in the Malaus, that wall that talks about the Walla Band, the Joseph Band of Nez Perce. There's a little screen over there, and you can go and touch on the screen, and you'll get the correct Nez Perce pronunciation of the place name. So if you don't know how to say it, you can Or if you do you like that, right, it's got some more I tell uh, the high school kids, when they come in here, that sometime they're gonna go away, they're gonna be in college or at a job, and somebody's gonna say, where are you from? And they're gonna say, Oregon. And they say, where in Oregon? And you're gonna say, Joseph. And they're gonna say, Joseph, Oregon. Is that where Chief Joseph is from? And you're gonna say, his name was in Matuyalakke. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll knock him dead, right? <laughs> okay, well, it's my great, great pleasure to have Nora Hawkins here. And I'm not gonna do it, I hope you all read her bio. I've never seen a bio book yet. I, I just, you know, but I knew Nora before she did any of those things. <laughs> because Nora and her two sisters and her mom came into the old book loft uh, for their weekly ration of books. Their mom, Carol, was, uh, as, as amazing as her daughters, she uh, put those three girls through Catlin Gable and Smith College, and they've all come home, yeah. you know, right, to the yeah. wilds. So with no further stuff, Nora, Thanks. it's all yours. Okay, well, we'll see. I think I can see. <laughs> so hopefully everybody is uh, ready to hear a little bit about Antarctica. Um, ideally, I'll be talking a bit about women in Antarctica, but you can't talk about Antarctica without the history that is men. Um, so, we'll get started. It is, if I'm pointing this the right way, at the bottom of the planet, most people probably know. Um, so it's kind of at the very bottom, it's the fifth largest continent. Um, it's totally covered in ice, but underneath the ice there is solid land. Um, usually it is reached, if I can figure out this laser point, oh, oh, wrong button, um, from South America over here or from New Zealand over here. And this area here is kind of what I'll be talking a lot about because that's where the main U.S. base is. Can you guys see that okay? So it looks a lot like this. It's stunning and beautiful. See my cup? I can't move, it turns out. Thanks. So in, there was kind of myths of this Terra Australis for a long time. And there's some theory that some folks from New Zealand had traveled down there and found it. But in the 1700s, James Cook saw it in 1773. And um, before that, a few other people had seen it, including this woman, Jean Barrett, who went, I'd like disguised as a man on a ship. Um, and her partner, to whom she was not married, so everything about their life was very mysterious but she was decades and decades. His partner was a botanist and he was in pretty ill health. So when he got invited to join this expedition, it really was her that was doing the legwork of hiking up the mountains and returning with samples and also kind of doctoring his wounds and ulcerated things and he could hardly walk on the ship. So she was kind of a forefront of scientists in Antarctica, but very much disguised as a male. They got to Tahiti after they had sailed around and the Tahitians were not fooled. 
and said there's a woman and then the captain had to kind of say like well i guess i'm doing this illegal thing having this woman here so when they pulled into port in Marianas, which is in the indian ocean they all got off with another friend and stayed for years continued to be um, botanists her partner did pass and then she married another frenchman moved home with um, some pretty heavy earnings she had had from running a tavern and um, gifts from her prior lover that had kind of left her his estate. So she settled well in France at the end of her life and even then got a stipend from the French Marine Society because they recognized her work on this early expedition as being totally fundamental. Um, so that is the first woman. Then there was decades and decades where women were absolutely not allowed to go. Um, so some of the men that we'll talk about, you know, Shackleton and Scott here in a minute, they had women that applied and they did not make the cut. Um, in 1937, there was 1,300 women that applied for one of the British expeditions. None of them got a call back. Um, this woman over here kind of highlights some wonderful myths about Antarctica, which is that maybe Santa Claus is at the North Pole with penguins. There are no penguins on the North Pole. There are no polar bears at the South Pole, but everyone will ask if you saw them. Um, to that end, I randomly have two little strips of polar bear hide. This has nothing to do with Antarctica. This is just cool. And if you ever want to touch a polar bear hide, because they're extinct and we probably won't ever get to, there's two little pieces. So the Arctic and the Antarctic often talked about together. A lot of the early explorers had been to both. So Amundsen, Nansen, a lot of the first folks that went to the Arctic went also to the Antarctic. So these are the guys we're familiar with hearing about. Ernest Shackleton went several times, originally as a crew member um, with uh, Robert Scott, and then he led his own expeditions later. Uh, Robert Scott led several expeditions. He died in Antarctica, almost back home to his base, but didn't make it. Um, all the men that he had been with had perished, you know, within the months or weeks or days before he also um, didn't come out of his tent. Roald Amundsen is the guy that went to the South Pole first. So the Norwegians have a huge, rich history in Antarctica that we don't talk about a ton. Um, they were whalers, they were sealers, they were early explorers, they were really good at doing what they did. Um, so there was this kind of Antarctic heyday in the early 1900s of everyone trying to race to the pole, and a lot of money got poured into that race. Um, so these guys are important. Um, this is kind of like an early women in Antarctica for morale boosting. A lot of those expeditions did have various addresses on board so that they could have parties and have the company of women and dance and kind of have a morale booster. So this is a guy, I believe he's on Scott's, one of Scott's expeditions. Um, and then this men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success, Ernest Shackleton. So this is why they were like, this is not a place for women, it's actually probably not a place for men either, um, but come along. So this is some images that you've probably seen when you think of Antarctica. Long, hard treks in the ice with your ship or your dogs. Uh, so Ingrid uh, Christensen and Mathilde Wagner were the first women to see the continent, um, other than Jean Barrett, who had seen it 150 years earlier. These uh, gals were wives of Norwegian whalers. So they saw it first, and then a few years later, um, Carolyn Mickelson, also a Norwegian whaling wife, um, actually stepped foot and put the Norwegian flag on Antarctic soil. So those are the firsts. Um, in 1947, um, Jackie Roan and Jenny Darlington went with their husbands on an expedition, and this was kind of prior to a lot of the science that was happening before the Navy very officially said, absolutely no women. Um, so those two gals went on an expedition with their husbands and a crew and stayed for a year. Um, in the 1950s, the U.S. Navy had a very firm um, policy that women were not allowed on anything. Um, and they had tried, you know, for the decades until it was allowed to get scientists to be able to go down there. Um, in 1956, Russia um, started sending women um, they had some geologists and, and oceanographers that charted some of the uncharted oceans. Um, 
1958, the community really tried to send a group of women that were kind of the forefront of their science, and they were not allowed to go. Um, in 1959, um, British and Australian scientific communities kind of welcomed women. Um, in 1968, Argentina started welcoming women to come on their science crews. These folks over here are Argentinian. This is Jackie Roan. These other gals down here are Argentinian. And then in 1969, we went to the moon, and we also lifted the ban on women going to <laughs> Antarctica. So these are the first ladies that did it. Um, this group of four scientists were studying in the dry valleys, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, and kept to themselves and very strictly, because they did not want anyone to kind of disparage women going to the ice. So they did not socialize, they did not hang out with the men, they just did their science and kept to themselves. Um, and then they did get to go, there was another woman that was doing some research just inland on a glacier, and another woman that was doing some research on penguins, and they, the six of them, did get to go to South Pole as kind of a, a boondoggle, and they all stepped off at the same time together, and the men cried like, this is the loss of the finals bastion for male supremacy. <laughs> and they're powder puff explorers and a bunch of things I didn't want to write. Um, but it was definitely not welcome. Um, and then, lo and behold, the floodgates opened. Um, so in 1974, the chief scientist they named to stay for the winter was a woman. And because they did not think it was appropriate she would stay alone, they also sent a nun. So those two <laughs> women were the first to winter over. Um, and then the British Antarctic Expedition really started allowing a lot more than they had in the late 50s. Through the 80s and 90s, there's kind of this rapid expansion of women from all the countries, a whole bunch of different countries also set up science places. There's a treaty that happened in the late 50s that's the Trans-Antarctic Treaty, and it protected, and still does until 2048, protects Antarctica from any kind of soil or marine extraction. So after World War II, there was a fair German presence, and there was concern that perhaps they would set up camp and rekindle their old ways. So the international community came together and said, we can't have Nazis in Antarctica. Let's make this treaty and have it for science, which was revolutionary and cool and is still that way. And um, apparently, have I gone backwards? Yeah. Um, so they, to this day, you have to share the research. If you find something and then a Russian says, hey, can I see your paper? You absolutely have to, under the treaty, share all of your information and everything. And you cannot dig for gold or oil or a lot of the things that we now know Antarctica is full of, and it's pretty easy to get to. And you're not going to upset any native community or anybody. So there's some pretty deep work right now, because 2048 is basically tomorrow, and um, that's going to expire. So how do we continue to protect it, dumb line, um, is, becomes important. So now um, we kind of get into what I felt like was complete integration. I'm looking at Jane, because she's also been to Antarctica, but I certainly felt like the doors were open. I was expected to drive the equipment, to lift the heavy things, to, to play my part. And I didn't feel barred, and I didn't feel coddled. I just felt like there's probably one in five, one in four people are women now. And that's everywhere from galley keepers and cooks to chief scientists to station managers to all the, all the parts. Um, so when you get there, um, I'm going to change outfits because it's quite warm. But uh, <laughs> now that I'm no longer the historic Antarctic person, woman getting there, um, now you can go on the belly of a C-17, which is a really cool, huge military aircraft. And, uh, so you go to New Zealand, and they outfit you with really warm clothes. They train you on how to recognize crevasses and how to work as a team and all kinds of things. And then uh, you arrive to a totally different fun community. <laughs> that was just what I was waiting for. Um, this is the Pegasus Airfield. Since then, they now have the Phoenix Airfield, which I have not seen. But they've moved the ice airfield. So this is a sheet of solid, a lot of aircraft on it. And uh, McMurdo Station is right on this bay. So the main kind of Navy port is right on this bay. And then the Royal Societies are those mountains that you see across. So the backdrop is beautiful. 
This is McMurdo, which is, I don't know if beautiful is the right word for it. Um, there's no organic material, really, in Antarctica. There's no dirt, there's no trees. Uh, it, is, it is rock that has been scoured by ice for millions and millions of years. Um, which today, when I was finding my rocks, I found a little thing that actually, um, when I did the Friends of the Library talk in 2010, I had written myself some cliff notes, and I found them. So, um, there was something when I read it. I was like, oh, that's an interesting part about this, but oh well, I don't know what it is. Um, so, how long maybe it had been frozen? 25 million years, it's been where it is. It came off Gondwana from South Africa, floated down there, has been there for 25 million years. Um, 15 million years ago, the ice kind of replaced the forests, and it was no longer a place that could sustain life. Six million years ago, the cap as we know it has been there. So everything that's kind of as it is now has been more or less that way for six million years. So McMurdo is a Navy base. Um, it's the main U.S. base. Um, there's a bunch of, like, dorms. Oh, gosh, guys, sorry. Um, there's a bunch of dorms over here, a bunch of cargo and supplies, a bunch of science down here. This is where the helicopter station is, which will come in handy soon. Um, a bunch of stored fuel. And then this road goes over the hill down to Scott Base, which is a much smaller, super wonderful um, neighbor of, of New Zealand. Um, so they have a camp there too. Uh, it's kind of an industrial place. Windy, snowy. They really do their effort at recycling, which is quite confusing. You find yourself in a line, not sure where things actually go. And everything gets shipped off the ice. This is also um, the same spot that Scott went on his 1901-1904 expedition. So this Discovery Hut is still there. Because it's so, so cold, everything is preserved. The sides of seal blubber inside are totally fine. Um, desiccated penguins, exactly as you'd expect to see them from one year of drying out, but it's been 100. Um, food. So um, the Russian, and I, I don't know now, I think we commissioned building our own icebreaker, but we used to borrow the Russians, and they would come down and man it. So the sea, this is where, kind of in the height of summer, the sea is melted out here, but base is over here. So how do you get there? You have an icebreaker, which is a special double or triple hold ship that can pound through the ice. Ours are old and defunct. Russia has several that work, so we work with them. They break the, break the entry in. Um, but I think now, I, I think they, we now have one, are making one. Um, and maybe I read it's out of Portland. Is anyone, did anyone read that? Like, is there a steel company in Portland that's going to make our next, next icebreaker? Yes, Todd says yes. So we are making one. Okay, so the cargo ship thing comes in. They build this ice pier. So this is compacted, man-made ice pier. And then you can unload the cargo ship with all your scientific equipment, huge um, tractors and transportation things that are too big for the C-17s. And then backload either you know, research, science, data that they're taking, or a ton of trash. Because every bit of food waste cannot be saved. So if you don't finish what's on your plate, it doesn't, they used to have a chute that went down under the ice into the ocean. Um, now they think that's not the best idea. The same with human waste. So now it all gets um, sent back to, I believe, California, where it then gets shipped inland and buried somewhere here. Um, on refrigerated vessels, nonetheless, because it would, it's got to go through the tropics. So, um, and it's a big deal. When the boat comes to town, it is a big, big deal. And when the Russians get off the ship, which they do a couple of times, it's a big, big deal because they look wild and cool um, and way rougher than us. This is kind of just a glance at transportation. What you'd expect, just everything has tracks um, and they're big. And a lot of things are off the ground um, because the snow really drifts when it blows. So the higher off the ground, um, you have less impact, but you also have less work to get it out. Hasn't changed a ton. I mean, this is the 1960s, and they look pretty similar. Um, crevasse fields are everywhere. Some of them are really hidden. Some of them are very obvious. It is definitely the danger. Um, before you leave McMurdo, so I went down the first year as a general assistant in a field camp. Um, and in order to leave town, you have to do snow school. So you um, rope up and go across the crevasse field, which you can kind of see some crevasses there. 
Um, and you have to make snow huts and spend the night in them, and it's pretty fun. And in New Zealand, they outfit you with all of these cool parkas and hats, and you get really a lot of stuff. Rock, which is um, like all the bands play, and people have a, have a big party. Um, it's not uncommon to see Fuelies randomly deciding to wear outfits that day, so these girls are, I don't know what they're feeling, but they're having fun doing it. Um, Mad Max was a pretty fun party. That's probably Todd and I's, I don't know where I'm pointing, first date. Um, and uh, if you do watch at the end of the movie, at the end I'll reference a movie that's really great, but Karen Joyce is kind of an Antarctic legend, and uh, she's in that movie. Um, there's, so kind of the science that's happening at McMurdo is roughly a quarter of the population and then three quarters of the population is support staff. So working to help keep all their things going. That's cooks, that's linemen, that's plumbers, that's heavy equipment operators, pilots, medical teams, everything it would take to run a town. Um, and then the scientists get to come and do their work. So sometimes they drive these piston bullies across the ice and then dig a hole. Sometimes there's a hut. Sometimes they go to the ice edge. Um, what they have found is that there's huge, huge starfish and things because there's very few predators under there. So they can just slowly grow and grow and grow. Um, so pretty different. And then some of that slow growth has been really integral for research with breast cancer and cancer in general of how do tumors grow if you change your temperature. Um, so they're bringing back weird little Antarctic cod that are like albino, sick looking fish and really cool, big starfish, all kinds of things. Um, a lot of these trackers are, you know, mapping the ocean floors and have GPS systems. Um, Long duration balloons happen kind of near the, near the airport and these huge balloons go up, they weigh like 30 ton, they are massive. Um, and they track weather patterns, they talk to satellites, um, they're looking at geo-tracking and then they have you know, a little bit of payload space for other scientists to occasionally say like, oh I have this little project, can I put it on your LDB balloon? And then they go around until they come down Ideally, they try to send the people out to get them, but many of them stay somewhere on the continent because they are, it's pretty hard to get in most places. Uh, the wildlife, Wooddell seals are really common and they're very cute. And then um, this is kind of McMurdo right behind me, and, or it's just off to the side, but there's these ice cracks that happen and the seals and the penguins can come up and take a break. And they are all over the place. Um, elephant seals are on the other side of Antarctica, so below South America. And leopard seals, thank goodness, which are the mean ones, are also on the other side of the continent. But those are some of the seals you'd expect to see. You guys actually see it all? Yeah? That's a polite, polite yes. Um, emperor penguins are the noble, big kind of ones we all, I don't know, I think they're in the movies. Adelie penguins are super cute and chittery and social and make you laugh. You can't help. They come up to you like that. and. They're really cool. Um, there's whales, there's humpback whales and killer whales. Um, some of the work that I did after my first year in a field camp but based out of McMurdo involved getting scientists to go tag whales and it was really cool. South Pole Traverse is another huge thing that happens so they're now driving fuel and bigger things to South Pole because they really can't get them on the aircraft. Um, South Pole is really high elevation and very cold and very windy and the days that you can actually fly there are pretty limited. So, um, you know, for a hundred years, people have been going up the Beardmore Glacier um, and then across the plateau to the South Pole. So now, like these guys will lead the way with these little things that try to detect if there's a crevasse out there. And if they find one, then they blow it up and either it's a small one and they fill it in or it's big and they make a bridge or they go around it. Um, but they have pretty good, it's almost like a highway now. Like they go every year multiple times. Um, and they can move a lot of fuel um, and they can bring back trash <laughs> that has been just building up in the South Pole. The South Pole is another uh, United States base. Again, you can see it's kind of off the ground so that snow can blow underneath it. There's a bunch of physics that goes on here with neutrinos, which are these ancient, ancient, ancient life forms that are kind of always hurtling around um, our galactic universe and they move really fast and they're teeny tiny. 
Um, but they have figured out ways under the ice that they can catch some of them or see their little tracers when they come through. Um, there's a bunch of, of um, astro astronomy that goes on. I'm not as familiar with South Pole Station Science because I have never been to South Pole. Um, but it is the smallest, second smallest of the US bases and pretty coveted to get to go, but it's flat white. Okay, so this map is important to kind of see this cap that goes over it. So this frozen bit is ocean. It has a constant sea ice shelf on it. Um, and then this is New Zealand over here. So the guys that, you know, Scott and Amundsen and all those guys, Shackleton, had to figure out how to get the South Pole up this huge cliff, which is super treacherous, full of crevasses, and thousands and thousands of feet of elevation gain on very little supplies and food. So um, they found the Beardmore Glacier, which I think is this. It's not this one. I think it's right here. It's the Beardmore Glacier, and that's kind of always been the historic route. So that's where South Pole Traverse goes, leaves McMurdo, up the Beardmore, over, over there. Um, the first year I went, I was in Trans-Antarctic Mountains, which is this, this stretch of mountains um, kind of halfway between McMurdo and the Pole. Um, and CTAM, the Trans-Antarctic Mountains camp, was geology and paleontology, meteorites, because anything that's sitting on that open white is not a rock from Earth. It's come elsewhere. Um, so they had just a bunch of skidoos they could drive around until they found a black rock. And almost always, they were meteorites. Um, and then my second and third year, I spent time in Pine Island Glacier, which has recently been pretty um, in the media and press. It's one of the fastest moving glaciers in the world and rapidly melting. Um, and my third year, which was my second year out there, Todd also spent the whole season, so we got to be there together, which was pretty cool. So this is the first camp that I um, was at, CTAM. It's kind of many field camps have this kind of a tent city, a row of science buildings, medical buildings, the galley where you'd eat, um, cargo, and then a taxi and a runway. This particular one had helicopters. Most of them do not. Um, I had fought fire and repelled, so I had the qualifications to be a helicopter member, which is why I got selected to go to this camp, which was super lucky and cool. So there's our crew. I think I counted up last night, there's six or seven women out of 19, so like one in three at this, this particular camp. Um, it was New Zealand uh, and US-based joint run. So kind of one of our mechanics was a Kiwi and one of our cooks was a Kiwi and quite a few um, of the scientists were Kiwis and it was really fun. Um, how do I make it advance? Sometimes it's cold. All of the women um, that ran that camp, all the people were women. Um, so the camp manager, uh, the assistant camp manager, the coordination specialist, every, every last person that ran CTAM uh, was a woman. And they were really fun. Um, so you got there by LC-130, which is a much smaller uh, military aircraft. So C-17s are huge. Um, Hercs or LC-130s are much smaller. They're still pretty big. Um, you can fit a lot in them. Um, and it was like the New York National Guard is the kind of contract that sends their crew members and their planes down. So in addition to these scientists and support staffers, you also have a bunch of like 20 to 24 year old New York kids that are not necessarily excited about deploying to Antarctica, though some of them were. Um, when it gets cold, you certainly have to keep the engines warm. So we had, we had heaters that went on anything that you needed to keep warm. Um, and then the, we got educated quite clearly how to do this very specific Air Force um, palletization of any kind of cargo. So that's how things come and go, is like that. Um, we also had um, Baslers and Twin Otters in camp from British Antarctic Survey. Um, for a little while, um, and then from the U.S. base as well, and a bunch of skidoos. And a lot of times the blowing snow would make it so you couldn't see, but it was a beautiful, clear day if you just looked up. So it wasn't like it was snowing, it was just moving around on the surface. Um, helicopters in camp. I still feel like you guys probably can't see. Um, so this is, can you hear me still if I step away from that? Okay. Um, pretty kind of typical field camp. 
Um, and this, I believe there was like 18 or 20 of us as staff, staff and another 40 scientists, so probably 60 people moving in and out over the four months we were there. Um, and they have a pretty slick setup where they can put up these tents. Carpenters come out from town, put up the tents, stretch the covers over them, and it's pretty comfortable. <coughs> Lots of amazing clouds in the Transantarctics. Uh, food storage. So you just dig down and then put a cap on it or leave it outside because it's quite cold. Um, I was there in the summer times only, so 24 hours of sunlight and very um, dry. So not, I've been much, much colder here than I have actually in Antarctica, although sometimes the winter it was rather cold. But usually, like by the middle of summer, it was 25 degrees which is and dry, so not humid or damp and quite pleasant. <coughs> Easy to get sunburned. Uh, this is inside the galley, just kind of a typical, um, this is the biggest tent always, and if there is really bad weather, everyone musters in, in that space. Uh, wash tent, so you haul, haul ice in and melt it on a little fire. You can do your laundry if you're out there for months at a time in this sweet little thing. Um, I don't know exactly where I'm pointing. This is important. So you melt a hole in the ice as low as you can go, and then you just kind of slide your outhouse over the hole. Um, this was a big part of my job my first year, um, was busting down stalagmites uh, that would freeze and not kind of smoosh out like you would normally want in an outhouse. Um, so I would have to like pop off the top of these poosicles, um, which was actually fairly entertaining. This kind of tent city inside it was very very pleasant you know how it is in a hot tent with the sun on you so it wasn't usually that cold yeah. although sometimes it was and when it got too bad then everyone you know there was announcements that you had to had to come to the galley um this kind of sun dog effect of crystals in the air was really common and they're beautiful um a lot of the equipment doubled both to move snow and groom the runways and to load and unload aircraft. This is our OSHA approved uh, putting back together of equipment that was too heavy for one flight or too bulky for one flight. So you can, where there is a will, there is a way. Um, you do spend probably a full day in Christchurch doing OSHA training to make sure you don't do things like this. <laughs> Um, a lot of my day, I was rolling cargo straps all day long. It felt like I would roll straps, put up new flagging, they'd get ripped off in the wind. They'd, somebody would drive over them in a skidoo or not see them, or you'd find another place. Or um, They were bringing back a ton of uh, dinosaur artifacts, so our science cargo area kept growing. So you have to flag the ends of things. So as a general assistant, um, loading and unloading helicopters, which is what I'm doing here, um, and then delivering it to people's tents or to various places. It's kind of much of my day. Um, then we'd have these satellite camps. So this is a little satellite camp that wasn't in our main camp. These, uh, these guys were collecting meteorites. So they lived, gosh, they were probably out here for two and a half months. Um, and then they came back around Christmas time and did a show and we got to hold them, although you cannot touch them with your oily earth hands. They're really heavy, really, really heavy. Never, I love rocks and those are heavier than anything I've ever held. Um, these are just scientists doing their job. We have these poo buckets, um, but there's never enough buckets of other things so that um, they send you more poo buckets than you'd ever need really. And so all the time, like you're actually putting your food in the poo bucket and not ever using it for poo. Um, but so it's a joke that you're having your human waste cookie. Um, so because the Trans-Antarctic, you know, they're 12, 13,000 feet and the, the ice is a mile and a half thick in this part of, of Antarctica. So there's a lot of it that is sticking out above the ice and it had been part of South Africa. So they know very well where they can see different rock formations and where they're likely to find what they're looking for and you hover around an helicopter, you find a spot to land, and they go and say, here's trees, here's this old forest that's petrified, here's this dinosaur bone, this is way bigger than the one so-and-so found 20 years ago. Um, 
it was pretty exciting science. A lot of the other field camps are doing really important things with climate studies, so really, really deep ice core drills, um, which are very cool, but not as cool as dinosaurs <laughs> at all, in my own opinion. Um, whoops. So they just jackhammer and rock and cut um, until they get the bones out. And some of them were huge. They were like, I remember one that was this two meter long head of this burrowing lizard that had to hide from something that was bigger than its two meter long head and it pretty much lived underground its whole life because it was not anywhere near the top of the food chain. Um, and it was terrifying and it looked like a huge crocodile head. Um, so I'm really glad I wasn't alive when these poor things had to, <laughs> had to run away and hide if you were a huge dinosaur. Um, some of them are, there's a lot of fossils, so looking at imprints of worms and different casts for different leaves and kind of what little biota, not big, big dinosaurs, but what little things are out there. Sometimes I'm not sure where I'm putting this. So worms, leaves. I do have a few small pieces of things like that over here, which afterwards I think people are welcome to just kind of to go through. Um, tree ferns, petrified wood, whole forests, you know, sometimes you'd see where it would just be like almost stumps that had been sheared off, but the petrified stump, and you could see where once there was a standing, standing forest, and then just really cool um, geology that without having to get a dig permit and move all the material of earth off, you can just walk around and see it. Um, this is uh, Beardmore Glacier, which is where Shackleton, um, Scott, a lot of those guys use this, and this is where the South Pole Traverse um, also comes up. In, I believe, 1959, they had an Operation Deep Freeze camp out here, and they left a bunch of stuff, and they decided to have us go clean it up. And it was so many helicopter flights to try to find it, so, 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 so many flight hours because then the weather would be bad and people would be stuck and it took weeks. What we found was um, old candy. Um, like it really, nothing was there, but there was lobster tail, which was, had been frozen and was great. We ate it for Christmas. There was butter and we were out and the weather had been bad and we were low on the totem pole getting flights from McMurdo. So we had some butter and some lobster that we weren't getting from town. Um, but pretty much it was just under meters and meters of blown snow that had accumulated above this little hut and they had left the hut, an outhouse, um, and then a few boxes of food in the hut. So it was a ton of work to get this stuff out. And um, I don't know that it was really saving the environment any. Um, so 24 hours of daylight, usually um, not that many hours of work. So there's a lot of downtime, a lot of musicians. I don't quite know why sometimes it there we go. You could take hikes from the Transantarctic camp where I was. A lot of the camps, um, there's too many crevasse fields, or there's, you know, you could maybe go skate skiing on an approved route, but there's not mountains to climb. But there were at CTAM. Um, and then those cool Air Force pilots make really, really fun sleds. So um, this was also a fun activity. Um, comms tent. Just people playing music and hanging out was pretty pretty common. Uh, the next two years of the field camp I was at was Pine Island Glacier, so pig. Um, we broke down the two of our smaller helicopters and sent them out. Um, and they wore these little jackets any time to cover them from the blowing snow. Um, and this was really cool science that was um, kind of, so they had two things. These ice core, or not ice core, excuse me, this was the second part of this thing. So this is a team of few different people that have equipment up here and then a different group from some other university has equipment down here and somebody else has it and they're they drilled with hot water um, all the way through Pine Island Glacier to the ocean below and then dropped with weights and drilled into the sediment below. So this guy who is part of the British Antarctic Survey was looking at the sediment and the silt for what kind of biology was still in there. So first they would drill and drill and drill for days with water. Um, and then they would send, I think they did three, I don't know where Todd is, but I think they did three of these super, super expensive 
years of scientists accumulated work to get these things down and then the idea is they'll um, freeze near the bottom and they can look at GPS tracking and rate of melt and seismic activity all over the continent, which is pretty cool. Um, the other great thing about this is that because it took hot water to drill the holes, uh, we did get to have a couple of um, hot tubs, which were filthy, and I don't quite know why that would be. Um, but generally, you could, you know, once a week, you could shovel a bunch of snow and melt it and get a five gallon semi tepid shower, which sometimes we did and sometimes it wasn't worth it. So the hot tub is pretty sweet. Um, and this is at the drill camp. So the actual drill camp was not necessarily safe enough to have the whole camp. So they set up our pig camp, which was the bigger one, a few miles away, many miles. And then you could either by Twin Otter or Hilo go to the actual drill camp. Um, so both years, because I was helicopter related, I got to go spend time um, in their camp, which was pretty fun. And just, you know, fascinating, interesting minds from universities all over getting together, kind of hashing over what they've been learning. So it was really fun conversations. Um, in McMurdo, the helicopter station is kind of right here. The sea ice is down here. This is the road up from the um, airport. Um, so we would take off from there. We had four helicopters, two large ones, two small Basically, my job here was like a flight attendant minus the drinks. So I would load and unload um, helicopters. I would brief passengers on safe techniques and should we crash, what to find where, um, and then jam them in there like sardines, take them to wherever they were going, and see you later. Sometimes it was, we'll be back and pick you up in a few hours. Sometimes we stayed with them because they just needed to update some piece of equipment or something had stopped tracking and they just needed to reboot it. Sometimes they were out there for months and we would come with mail and bananas from town and it was super fun. Sometimes it was one week, they got their work done and then we'd come pick them up. This part of my job very much felt like packing where it was like people meet you and you're like, oh gosh, how am I gonna get this on a mule? How will I put this in a, in a helicopter? And then you take them where they're going, come back and pick them up. Um, some of the places we went were really pretty sketchy. <coughs> some were not. Um, sometimes it was too windy, so something might be on your flight, you know, for days on the schedule, and it was too windy to ever go. Um, Mount Erebus is one of the most active volcanoes in the world. Um, there's another one in Kenya and another one in Indonesia, I believe. The other two are pretty uh, politically difficult and dangerous to get to, so this one in Antarctica is the easiest one. Um, to get to, and um, there's huge crevasse fields to get up to it, so super dangerous to go over land, though those early explorers did figure it out, um, and many of them did not come back from trying to figure it out. Um, it spews these Erebus crystals, which I'll let folks look at, that are, there's only one other place in the world that these form, and they just, they just pop out of the crater, um, and if you polish them, they're really beautiful. So there's a bunch of volcanology going on up there. Um, these fumaroles are things that it's like, like a heat vent, but if you have a bunch of ice, it just creates these cool towers all over that steam and vent. It's totally lunar landscape. Um, and as a helicopter person, you have to drop people off up there and then take a quick spin. It's pretty high elevation, so you don't have much time because you can't take a lot of fuel on board. Uh, sometimes we went out to the sea ice. So this is um, stuff that does melt or it's not the ice shelf. So the ice shelf is coming off the continent and it's super thick and does not ever melt. The sea ice melts every year, refreezes every winter. Um, and there's these huge icebergs that are really tall. Um, and there's a bunch of marine science that goes on. These guys are getting uh, ice, ice cores. Uh, the research vessels that come in, if they can't get all the way to town, um, you can fly out and move people or things. So there's a couple of American research vessels that don't really come to port very often. They just cruise around the Southern Ocean, usually taking off from Patagonia. Um, when the sea ice converges and smashes into itself, it creates these really cool waves of ice. And then out of those is where the seals and the penguins can find their little cracks to come out. Um, and it's beautiful. Sea ice is really magical. 
Uh, the rookeries. Um, anyone that has been around a lot of birds, which seems to be something I've done a lot of in my life with my, sick and my sister's chicken <laughs> operation, these things reek. They are so smelly and so gross with thousands and thousands of birds sliding around on their bellies in so much poop. Um, they're really cute when they're clean and just have been for a swim, but we would often have to go to these rookeries and it was so foul, like, get there and just... Um, and then therein lies this situation where you're not allowed to fly over open water, but there's a bunch of crevasse fields right up here, so you just kind of hug the shore, and I guess would go for the cliff if something took you down. Um, but you get there, this particular one, uh, that rookery is Cape Royds. This is Shackleton's um, original hut. Again, fantastic condition because nothing seems to deteriorate um, right below Erebus. So the, the rookery is right kind of going that direction. And um, a lot of these explorers did that on purpose. They had a fresh source of meat and eggs. And the rookeries tend to be places that thaw. So it's places that they could get their boats realistically, because a lot of times they would get dropped off and then their ship would come get them in one or two years. And there's not always a guarantee that the same thing is going to melt. Um, but the rookeries are pretty safe bet that it melts every year. Um, Cape Evans, this is uh, a really cool hut. Um, Scott was on his expedition to the South Pole. He was racing Amundsen from Norway. He was one month behind him. Um, and then everyone died on the way back. Uh, except for the guys that stayed at the hut and waited for him. And then when they didn't come back, they did venture out and find, I think, two of the bodies. But the others were way inland and I don't know. Um, but they took horses. They took ponies. That was their way to say, I think we'll go faster than if we took dogs. Um, the joke was definitely on them. All the horses died. And Amundsen, with his crew of dogs, efficiently and in good spirits, made it to the South Pole and back home. Um, so they took these horses aboard the ship. Um, this is, there's still plenty of these. This is a picture I took of the snowshoes that they tried to outfit those horses with, which you can see why it would definitely make them lame. Um, pretty rough. Um, although the camaraderie and morale of it is important, it did not end up being a successful choice. Um, the stalls, everything, the tack hanging there is totally still and you could oil it up and use it because it's nothing, there's no microorganisms breaking anything down. It is just totally fine to eat 60 year old butter <laughs> or 100 year old whale blubber if you wanted. Um, the dry valleys are in the Royal Society. So those mountains I showed you right across from McMurdo, these are incredible. Um, they're the highest, the driest um, desert in the world, way drier than the Sahara. Um, and there's a ton of different science that goes on in the dry valleys. So this is a system that's coming off the ice sheet that's kind of the cap of the continent, then comes tumbling down these valleys, much of which have been completely scoured um, of any, any ice in the air. Sand, rock, wind ripped, they're really cool. Um, and there's a few kind of permanent camps every summer um, that happen out here in a bunch of science. So this is pretty much every day, part of your daily commute as a helitech would be out to the dry valleys. Um, this is a look at what a couple of those camps look like. Um, they're on lakes that have a little bit of ice over the top of them, but are, are fresh water underneath. So there's a bunch of science going on about that mineral composition that's coming out of the glaciers that are melting above them and the teeny tiny, tiny little microflora that does live there. Um, there's a lot of, you can hear just charging rivers when you're nearby and it looks like ice, but it's this fast flowing water. Um, just the ice patterns on various places are pretty cool. Um, Sky Tem is like LIDAR, so this big heavy thing flies around. We were very, very um, minutely informed about what this project was actually doing. Um, they, they scoped and mapped a ton of territory and kind of we all understood it to be like, where is the gold and where is the oil? Um, but really no one, even the pilots, weren't really aware what all the equipment was actually searching for and mapping. But it was a huge project um, uh, that went on second year, I guess. Um, glaciers. So there's a ton of science and cargo movement up and down glaciers. 
Sometimes we had to fly quite a ways to them. Sometimes people were at the, at the foot doing something. A lot of ice. Some super smooth, some really rugged. So sometimes crevasse fields are very predictable. You can see that. And sometimes, like this place, I actually walked away to get this picture and stepped in a piece of snow I shouldn't have stepped in and totally actually almost tore my MCL, bashed my pubic bone and was like, I can't get out of this hole. But it was just big enough for one leg. Um, and I was pretty, pretty laid up for a couple weeks. Um, and did not go any further than that. So kind of everywhere you're landing, it was always like, is my skid going to... Yeah, one of those things in life. Actually, some of these helicopter things, I was like, this is, I should not tell my mom what I'm doing. <laughs> um, so, and then repeater sites. This was probably one of the most fun things. Um, commun communications, things that go up on high mountains have to take maintenance. So, and usually you would stay with them, so you'd shut down the helicopter because the landing is really sketchy. So you can see here, like the front of our skids are almost off and the back of the tail is off. So there's this one spot. And sometimes like this Mount Terror, you would have that come up on your docket for two weeks before it was like the weather was right and you could go. Um, and then you didn't leave, you stayed there um, while they set up whatever they were doing and you got to hike around and sit on super tall, fun things overlooking the ocean. Um, uh, again, just more repeater sites, bull pass. This place is really miserable and has a little hut because very often people, you can't leave. Like you can get there, but you can't go away. Or the stuff they need to do is going to take a few days to update. Um, so that place does have a place for those guys to actually stay. Uh, a lot of places we went were too far away, so you'd have to stop at fuel caches along the way. Um, sometimes you could see them. Sometimes you just had to know the coordinates and find a flag and then dig and dig and dig until you got more fuel. Um, and a lot of times you just had time to play and make things and utter silence in this roaring noise that I've never heard. Like it was so quiet, it was loud. Um, once or twice, super windy, really, really windy, amazing rock formations for the wind. Once or twice, though you're absolutely not supposed to, there'd be some need to like somebody to take a sling and somewhere and you couldn't be on board or you had to hook it up and then couldn't get on board. And a couple of times I did get to be left for like 45 minutes, totally, utterly, completely alone. And it was fairly unnerving, like really magical and special, but also a little bit scary. Um, and trying to sit with that and not be scared, but just then remembering all the people that have died in Antarctica because it's really not a place you should be. Um, so just stunning. Um, this area is probably like one of the most scenic of Antarctica. Much of Antarctica is an ice sheet that is flat white as far as you can see in every direction. So this is a misrepresentation of the whole continent. Um, but it's what I got to, what I was doing there. Um, super cobbled, crazy ice sometimes. Um, so this is that transition between the sea ice and the ice shelf. Super sketchy. And just pretty, pretty place. Um, someday when my girls are big, I want to go back and, I don't know, as a retired person, go be a shuttle driver. Um, I would love to go back. It's pretty amazing. And this is, I mean, this is really what most of it looks like. Just flat. You can't tell where the sky and the horizon stop. Um, this is pretty cool. This is what we now know of our ice cap. So this ice cap that's a mile and a bit thick sits on top of a continent. Vostok is this uh, Russian base. People there go for two years. Um, and it is this huge, huge, huge lake, kind of like our Great Lakes would be. Um, and they have a ton of research going on in Lake Vostok. Um, but there's a bunch of rivers coming out of the Transantarctics. Um, and then this is kind of just an update of like what's melting really quickly. And then as things are melting and the current shift, there's certain parts that are getting colder. Um, but that is really just a, a bigger sign of what's happening as things melt. Um, so a lot of this has changed and a lot of um, like things the size of Rhode Island are calving off of Pine Island Glacier pretty darn frequently. Um, yeah. Uh, so, recommended things. Mawson's Will. Mawson, Douglas Mawson is this Australian 
um, Antarctic explorer that went at the same time that Scott was trying to race to the pole and dying. Um, Mawson was, didn't care about getting the pole, he cared about science, and he put this really cool expedition together, and with five teams it went different places with this reuniting vision, um, and it is a terrifying story of Antarctic exploration. So if, it's, if there's one Antarctic book I could recommend, it would be Mawson's Will. Um, it's brutal and inspiring and sickening. Um, and then Werner Herzog, for anyone that uh, knows that kooky guy, um, he did a documentary called Encounters at the End of the World, which is hysterically funny and full of information and has a lot of the people that have been going for 20 or 30 years, um, kind of bios on them. And it's like, you know, PhDs are washing dishes and it's just such a to-go there's science lectures, people are always excited about their projects, so every Wednesday you can go hear what project is going on. And then there's usually many of the science teams need some kind of grunt labor to be filled. And so if you go to the lab and say, hey, have you ever needed a hand? They will come get you and say, hey, will you hold this fish while we dissect it? Or will you drive the piston bully and just make sure we come out of the ice after we've dove? Um, so there's so much opportunity to just have fascinating conversations with people from all over um, and and then you get an open-ended ticket on the way through New Zealand anybody that's like thinking about going up there you should go or you should just chat amongst yourselves because this is boring um, <laughs> but there is a ton of, of opportunity and then people to travel with um, so the National Science Foundation has this Office of Polar Programs which then houses the United States Antarctic Program so that's kind of the umbrella um, you sap.gov, then you could go to jobs and opportunities. There's tons and tons of jobs and opportunities. Um, or you could go as a scientist. Um, they have grants, opportunities. You can call universities and find out how to go. Um, you can go as a tourist. There's a bunch of organized uh, cruises that take people down there. And then the thing that's been happening a ton lately um, is just people exploring on their own. So with their own funds getting dropped off, and then they completely have outfitted their own expedition. And there has been many groups of women that are like the first six women to solo cross the entire Antarctic continent unsupported. Or the first person to ski to the South Pole and back completely unsupported. Um, many of these people are women. So nowadays there's this whole new way without needing you know, a decade of funding and stuff to get an expedition to just have deep pockets and a will for adventure and go do it. Um, if you do do that, I would recommend going to like one of the British bases or the Argentinian bases or just pretty much anything but ours, um, because ours is really strict about like you will not give them cocoa, you will not aid or help them, you cannot, if they are self-supported, they cannot have your friendship in any way. Um, and people have been fired for like giving them cocoa. Um, but the other, other places are more like, no, you've got to be neighborly. So if you do go that way, look up some other bases. <laughs> um, when I'm done, I'll take questions in a minute. Um, there's a series of books over here that are kind of interesting. This woman was the first physician to stay over at South Pole and then ended up actually diagnosing her own breast cancer and keeping a crew of men as she got sicker and sicker, um, walking them through how to do this biopsy, which she kind of did on herself and walked them through how to do it for her and administered chemotherapy to herself until they did a little bit earlier flight because you cannot get to the South Pole in the winter. It is a hard, you cannot go. None of the aircraft can make that cold um, climate. So she was stuck there. Um, fascinating story. Um, she did make it out and she lived several more years but did eventually not make it all the way. Um, Big Dead Place is kind of a modern look at what it is to be a USAP worker. It's very disenfranchised, bitter, all about the, the kind of the bad of the Antarctic program. Generally, um, Raytheon or Lockheed Martin or Lidos, like these big missile defense companies are the people that have the contract with our government to do it because they get big fat tax write-offs. So for a lot of people working for Raytheon, it was an ethical conflict. Um, and so it goes. Um, I have Erebus crystals. This is petrified wood. There is some fossils here. This is just kind of an example of wind. Um, just everywhere you go, it's littered with rocks. Um, yeah. 
It's it's one now. Okay. Number. So, so some people have to go. Maybe the high school has to go. I don't know. Okay. But you could. Uh, we could. We could yeah. stay on. Yeah, I'm ready for questions. I think I'm done. Okay. Yeah. Well. Or people could go. What? Um, if anybody has to leave, it's one o'clock. So go ahead. If not, you want to take some have some questions now. Sure. Can you what? Can we clap first? I'm sure. <laughs> Oh, like leaving trash behind and clutter? I think, you know, my information is 10 years old, so it wasn't too much of a problem then. Um, people are pretty clearly, it's so pristine, like, that you just wouldn't want to be the person to sully it, is the sense I got. Um, and certainly the, the USAP is super strict about every micro trash gets taken out. But I don't know now if, like, as there's more tourists, if it's becoming that way. I don't know. But not really. Not that I've heard. Yeah. Jane? What is this bone? That is a whale vertebra. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um. You know, you have this oil, like people used to historically just paint blubber on. Um, so does the oil, does it cause it to No, I guess not. I didn't actually try the blubber technique. Um, but they have this wind chap stuff that they issue you, and you just stuff your pockets and smear it on, and it's kind of like white zinc almost. Um, and you just, everybody just kind of is summered. Yeah. 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 I'm assuming it's diesel? Um, Avgas and yeah, there's different. Yes, it's all, it is treated specially for that climate. Yeah. Yeah. And so we'd take sling loads out and then, you know, here and there you could go use some. But, or, you know, a plane, you know, the Twin Otters offer huge support. And so they could take a lot and stash it and then the helos could go use it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. It's it's like the sun on a tent is an oven, and so as long as the sun is out, which it pretty much is in the winter, or our winter, their summer. It's pretty warm. There definitely, definitely was times like it was really cloudy and the sun was not out that it was quite cold. Um, but the sleeping bags are really good. You have many layers of things. Um, everyone's issued pee bottles, so like little Nalgene's that you can pee in, and a, you know a little funnel if you're a, a gal that helps you hit the Nalgene. So if it's bitter, you don't have to go outside. Um, you just all meet at the morning at the pee flag, and everyone's dumping their pee bottles together. Um, but yeah. And then the tents are special and have these long flaps that go out like two feet from the tent wall and you cover that with snow. And then all it takes is one snowstorm and that is drifted in pretty well. And then it's less likely. But certainly, you know, part of my job that first year was shaking off and digging out tents and yeah. 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 A what team? Ooh, I don't remember. That's a, no, that's a great question. I don't remember yeah. anyone finding old bodies. Like, for the most part, they know the people that have died out there, because yeah. there's not that many of them. And they kind of, I just, with you mentioning, like, how long ago people would just disappear, yeah. I wonder if they come across people once in a while, and what that process Yeah. Be. I think that, um, certainly for Mawson's story, if you read it, there is, like, you're right there with their dog train, and then they're gone. And you can hear a few whimpering dogs down there that didn't die, but your comrades are dead. So there's definitely yawning huge crevasses with remains that nobody can get people out of. So someday, they probably could find them. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, what brought you out to Parkland in the first place? Ooh. Um, lots of things. It was the seventh continent is one really, like, kind of not cool reason. Um, and I wanted to build a cabin, and all of my other jobs were summer. So, like, fighting fire, guiding, packing was summer. And in order to build that cabin, I was going to need to have my summers off. And so this seasonal work was exactly the opposite. So it was partially that it was winter, partially that it was the seventh continent, and partially because in fire I had met a few people that had gone and spoken pretty highly of it. Yeah. And I, I saw you have one. Regarding climate change, yeah. uh, a few questions about, you know, annual snowfall on there. Yeah. Your presentation noted that there were some areas where the ice was receding and then others that were being replenished. Yeah. Of course, in summer, all your photos were clear skies. But, totally. And I also note that, for example, like some of those historic huts, they weren't buried in snow. Right. So, um, it's partially that, and also Antarctica, while it's covered in snow, is actually a desert. It has almost no snowfall. It's one of the driest places in the world. It just has a ton of frozen water, but there is very, very little new snow. What there is in some of those places is drifting snow that will completely bury things um, over time, but there's almost none that is coming down. So what was climate change research? Yeah. Um, yeah, when I was down there, I feel like there was a day where we had a little little bit of snow and everyone was pretty amazed. I have no idea now how common that is. Um, but there, there's a ton of climate research and pretty much all of their, everything they're finding is like, this is all changing rapidly and melting rapidly and systems are very different. Yeah. Yes. The part that is there was a part that was breaking off and, and uh, disappearing, but there was also a part that was growing. Yep. Why is that? Because if that specific part would get cold? My understanding is that ocean currents with the calving of huge glaciers then start to get a little colder in some places, yeah. and the ocean will just redeposit that somewhere. Oh. But that's a very like elemental understanding of it. Okay. But yeah. And one other question. Oh. When, when you were in the big tubs of, of warm water, Yeah. Um, that were going to be used for drilling. Yep. Um, they heated the whole tub of water in order to suck, siphon that out to drill? Yep, it's this constant, continually, they're using that hot to just keep on drilling. So the, the drill site itself is this spewing, spewing water, um, which they're trying to get as much of it as they can back into the tub. Oh, I got it. Because it's melted and it takes a lot of energy to melt the and ice. how do they heat it? With some um, yeah, all kinds of, they had tons of different heaters. Actually, the guy that was in charge of all the mechanics of it is from Fairbanks, and he had all the all the tools and new things he'd created, and pumps and heaters that were, some of them were really big, some of them were pretty small. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. How did you get drinking water? Melted ice. Yep, so um, I don't know how many how many buckets of, you know, you'd haul and have this heater essentially that you'd, you'd put the ice in and the snow in and then you'd get ice or get water. Yeah. So, and then in town, I think they have a desalination plant, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in town they're using ocean water and just desalinizing it and they don't have to melt it. But in field camps, you gotta melt it and at South Pole. And melt it. And then I think this doesn't really talk about um, winter overs, which is a whole nother season. Um, some of these scientists will stay for winter, but almost none do. So it's just pretty much kind of this bare bones skeleton support staff crew. Um, it's there in the winter, and then it's 24 hours of darkness and southern lights and people going crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think so. so. You guys tell me to quit. <laughs> Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I don't recall Gondwana, which was the last big kind of mass that we split apart from. I don't remember where. I mean, I know it was Antarctica was up kind of next to next to South Africa, but before that, it would have been somewhere. 
That is, there's, it's so hush hush because there's a ton down and there's a bunch of gold. They know that. Um, but because it's protected under the treaty, they really aren't allowed to talk about it. But there is very much a feeling that there is people poised and ready for 1948 to be like, we're going to, or 2048 to go down and start taking it. So I don't know a ton about where the oil came from, but my understanding is they, they know it's there. Yeah. yeah. Or if it was the side of Africa next to the Middle East, I don't know. I'd have to I'd have to refresh my brain on what Gondwana looked like 170 million years ago. Yeah. Yes. You were saying that they take the ice cores out of the sea ice, mm -hmm. but not out of the land. They do. There's whole. Um, there is. They do both. Um, there's really, really, really long ice cores out of the mile and a half cap um, that's deep, and then the sea ice. And some of it is like carbon dating history. Some of it is that neutrino stuff that's always coming from outer space. Um, they're doing a lot of a lot of things. Yep. So I think we better okay. wrap her up, and people can go up and look at the artifacts. Yeah. And thank you again, Nora. Absolutely.